This is Akashwani. In the weekly program Current Affairs, now we bring a discussion on Semicon India 2023, India Semiconductor Mission. The participants are Sushma Ramachandran, Economic Analyst, Pranoy Kotasthani, Semiconductor Policy Expert, and S. Rangabhashyam, Anchor. Welcome to this program. Today, the Semicon India 2023 conference uh, kicked off in Gandhinagar in Gujarat, which is a three-day event. And uh, the Prime Minister himself was there to inaugurate uh, the event. A lot of things have been discussed, have been spoken about. We'll discuss all of that uh, with our panelists, uh, Pranay Kulasthane and uh, uh, Shushma Ramachandran. Uh, let me begin with you, Pranay, to talk about, you know, semiconductors, especially in the last couple of years, five, six years, it has come into sharp focus. Also, a contributing factor could be the shortage of, you know, semiconductors, uh, which we faced uh, in the last, you know, uh, three, four years. For the benefit of our listeners, tell us, uh, you know, what exactly semiconductors are and its role in computers, mobiles and, and other equipments. Yeah, sure. So, semiconductors or uh, we call them colloquially uh, as semiconductors, but they are actually integrated circuits and they are the basis of any electronics equipment that we use or uh, any of the phones and laptops etc that we use so they are really at the core of it uh, so all your mobile phones have processors have various types of chips and even if you have an electric vehicle they'll have a large amount of bill of materials which will be in the form of chips so that's really the important thing i mean there are lots of technicalities to it but for now it's important to understand that these are really crucial for making our electronics work the reason why they have become really important in the last three years is the way i say it is that semiconductors are not just critical but they are metacritical and they are metacritical in three ways one is there has been a lot of geopolitical considerations in the last two three years because taiwan is one place where a large amount of advanced semiconductors are made and because of worsening China-Taiwan relations, uh, there's a lot of focus by a number of countries, not just India, but in the US, EU, Japan, etc. as well, as to what will happen if China were to invade Taiwan for one or the other reason. How will they get access to the manufacturing facilities in Taiwan? So a lot of things are happening with that consideration in mind. The second concern is, of course, the thing that you mentioned related to shortages which happened during COVID-19. Now, the thing is, there are a lot of, the way this semiconductor industry has developed, there are, it's not just that one country develops all the chips that it wants. In fact, every country and a few companies within them specialize in only one part of the supply chain and making a chip is actually a global enterprise. Design is done in one country, the chip fabrication is done in another country, the assembly might be done in another country, so on and so forth, right? So what has happened because of this uh, wonderful structure is that although the costs of production have gone down, but also there are supply chain vulnerabilities that have been introduced, not just because of geopolitics, but also because of geoeconomics, you know, what happens if there's a drought in Taiwan, or what happens if ASML, which ad- uh, supplies the most uh, advanced chip manufacturing equipment, is not able to do that for one or the other reason, right? So there are bottlenecks throughout this supply chain, which again, the countries. Uh, were exposed to during COVID-19 and now they are trying to see if uh, a larger amount of this can be diversified across countries. The third reason for metacriticality is technological dependence. So, for example, any advancements in artificial intelligence will be dependent on new semiconductor architectures in the form of AI chips. If you want to do something on 5G, 6G, again, you will need semiconductor architecture. So it is like the base layer on which a lot of new technology will also be built. So these are the three reasons why semiconductors have become very important from a national perspective. And that's why a lot of countries are focusing on it. Uh, Shushwa, I'm sure you'll agree that, you know, in the last, you know, couple of uh, decades, especially in the last uh, two decades, uh, India has, you know, uh, opened up uh, Every sector and whether it is cars uh, or, you know, mobile phones 
uh, or or any of the electronic equipments in all these uh, areas um, uh, you know the okay. government had actually played a enabling kind of a of a role okay. even in this okay. do you think you know moving ahead in the next you know 4 to 5 okay. years uh, we will see uh, the results of the policies and strategy being adopted today well uh, first of all i must uh, 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 appreciate uh, pranoy's very uh, lucid presentation about semiconductors um i think uh, it's uh, you know we are of course uh, we talk in economic terms uh, and media terms but you know uh, one has written about electronics one has written about telecommunications but honestly till about 3 uh, years ago we didn't write about semiconductors much you know very rarely exactly and uh, the, it was the yes it was uh, precisely what he pointed out the uh, short and you pointed out the issue of shortages which suddenly hit us you know people started talking that about uh, uh, cars not being available cars are being held up uh, other equipment is not available and suddenly we realized that they are not available because we are not getting a very important electronic item and that is what known as the chip the semiconductor and suddenly the sem- semiconductor became very important and we all started honestly writing about it in the media so thank you pranoy for explaining all that uh, to us it was then uh, that you find as you rightly said that all the countries are now interested india too entered this uh, uh, this into this uh, policy making towards uh, you know towards semiconductor uh, manufacture and i think the first step really uh, we have to recall which we forget now was with the quad when they had uh, the quad uh, meeting about 2 years ago with uh, the us japan and australia where they entered into an agreement uh, a semiconductor initiative to set up this semiconductor uh, facilities using the expertise of each country because as uh, you know pranay may have pointed out that no one country has the expertise to uh, to set up everything that you need for a semiconductor so you require uh, you know one country may have the design one country may have the fabrication unit one country may have something else so the idea in the case of india it was felt that the uh, talent and the expertise that we have in terms of uh, software professionals um, uh, skilled uh, people available to uh, handle design etc you know india could contribute uh, in that way so uh, you know of course now after coming back to your question ranga yep. that did the uh, government's policies are they going to fructify it was after that that the government launched shortly after that launched the indian semiconductor mission and uh, it is fructifying in turn many ways uh, micron technologies recently agreed to set up uh, an assembly and packaging unit uh, in this country and uh, there are apparently many other proposals in the pipeline and i don't have to underline now the critical importance of semiconductors for the economy in the future if we are going to become a digital economy semiconductors are going to be very critical that's right and to talk about uh, the you know uh, people and uh, skilled manpower also uh, pranay um, i believe uh, now the government has identified some 300 colleges uh, which would be you know uh, having semiconductors in their syllabus uh, so that uh, in the next 5 years we can expect some around you know 1 lakh uh, trained engineers to be produced in the country so that surely will go a long way uh, in seeing to it that you know as far as the manpower is concerned uh, there won't be any shortages yeah so uh, ranga a few points there so first of all india is already a big player in the semiconductor design sector in the global ecosystem uh, the government estimates that 20% of semiconductor design engineers across the world are in india but the challenge now is that if you look at the top 10 semiconductor companies by revenue all of them have their design centers in bangalore right so already a lot of design engineering work does happen but what the current challenge is that the intellectual property of all the things that happens in these design centers is not based out of india right it finally belongs to american or european companies so the challenge in hardware and semiconductor design today is how can we now have indian intellectual property in fact the revenue of all indian companies put together only purely indian companies just about 150 crores which is a drop in the ocean so the government policies now are trying to develop talent so that actually you can have indian products made in india 
and they are owned by Indian firms. So that's where the challenge is. And I would add to Sushma ji's point that actually the current policies are different from the past policies in the sense that earlier the focus was just on manufacturing. There were attempts in 2006, in 2014 to uh, isolatedly uh, either have a assembly plant or have a fab. But these policies which were announced in December 2021 and then updated in September 2022, what they try to do is actually build a capacity across the semiconductor ecosystem in design, in fabrication, in assembly and in compound semiconductors, etc, etc. So that is a thorough vision of trying to develop capabilities across the sector. Now coming to design, that's where the talent element lies. And the idea is that even though we have a large number of engineers, there can be done, a lot more can be done to improve their capabilities such that they are not just able to do work that is outsourced from US companies, but to go up a notch and be able to conceptualize architectures of chips manu and make those chips in India, right? So that is where the talent gap is. Uh, and that's what the government policies are trying to do. In fact, like you said, there is a lot happening with uh, starting new VLSI design courses. That's a good move. We need to do a lot more there. We also need international partnerships in this regard. So Purdue University and Métis have collaborated already so to again develop talent. Uh, when the Prime Minister was in the US recently in, uh, for the official state visit, LAM Research, which is a top semiconductor manufacturing equipment maker, has promised to train 60,000 engineers in India on various aspects of semiconductor manufacturing. That all is a great move, you know. So the way you can see it is we have some capability in design already and the government policies are trying to improve that, go take it to the next level. But uh, manufacturing and in assembly, we don't have that much capabilities and some of these international partnerships will help us train uh, human power very quickly on those regards. So yeah. that is sort of how the talent angle is. Yeah, uh, Pranay, uh, we all do acknowledge and why actually the entire world acknowledges that India is a, a kind of a hub for software. You know, we have proved ourselves time and again, uh, software, business process, outsourcing, all this has happened in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, but somewhere, do you think we have missed the bus as far as hardware is concerned, hardware manufacturing is concerned, and even in hardware, you know, semiconductor manufacturing, had we actually missed the bus and now we are late and now we are entering the bandwagon? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are not just semiconductors, semiconductors at the higher end. We also didn't do much of electronics assembly. And there are a lot of past government policies, etc. I mean, before 1991, the economy was anyways closed. So it was very difficult for companies to become competitive in the export market, do anything which was supplying to a global market and try to become competitive globally, right? So we used to do a small bit of things. So for example, there's a semiconductor complex limited SCL, which was a government run entity. It was do producing some niche semiconductors. Bharat Electronics Limited was producing uh, some semiconductors, but they, their focus was never about supplying commercially becoming big global players they were focused on the defense and strategic sectors and given that they were government entities there was no incentive for them to also become big global players so that was the reason why version one of indian semiconductor policy sort of didn't pick up then in 2006 to 2010 was the version 2. There were a number of attempts made uh, first in 2006 to start a fab city in Hyderabad uh, that again couldn't take off. So version 2.0, the failures were related to our complex tax policies. You would remember the Vodafone tax policies, yeah. the retrospective tax policies, etc. were a big barrier for semiconductor investment, you know, because these are places where a lot of upfront capital investment is required, billions of dollars are required, and the first revenue will start coming up only four or five years after you have made the investment, right? So no one is going to take that big step unless there is policy stability, tax stability, trade policy friendliness, and all those were still barriers. And now there are some of those barriers still remain, but there are now things done. For example, in the recent policy, the government is providing upfront capital support uh, up to 50% 
for manufacturing and also for assembly which was not there in the past you know so those are some ways in which the government is trying to overcome the failures of the past and provide a fresh start to semiconductor and electronics assembly in india yeah uh, shushma let's also you know talk about the you know political uh, angle and political aspect of uh, mm. you know this particular sector many a times you get to read in the media uh, that you know uh, a certain company had approached a certain state government they did not get a good response mm. they they moved on to some other state and there's bickering between mm. the state and the uh, central mm-hmm. government uh, don't you think uh, uh, these kind of uh, things play a spoil sport instead of you know state uh-huh. government supporting the initiative of the central government and you know up front uh-huh. having a single window clearance uh-huh. for maybe you know such priority areas the state government's processes are still uh, wrapped in you know red tape and that could uh-huh. play spoil spot yes um, absolutely you are right uh, you know it's uh, i think uh, there's not a uh, uh, there's not a proper understanding of the way in which corporates or business works whether it is a domestic industry or whether it is foreign investors they are going to go where they get the best deal i mean that's the bottom line now uh, if there is a, a tiff i mean a tussle between two states to get a particular uh, corporate to invest that corporate is not going to shift for political reasons that corporate is going to go because one particular state offered them better incentives or they have better infrastructure now we all know that there are certain states in the country that have better infrastructure uh, one of them is gujarat one of them is maharashtra one of them is tamil nadu uh, karnataka also so these are states which have uh, you know good infrastructure in many ways whether it is power infrastructure in terms of or supply and also infrastructure in terms of an let's say the ease of doing business also because in a state where you have a lot of industry you will find that the bureaucratic setup is geared towards uh, providing support to industry so a lot of it is i would say it's a lot of hype and uh, a lot of it is speculation but i think any industry when you if you're investing billions of dollars millions of dollars and billions of dollars you are not going to shift simply because you like a particular politician or you like a particular political party you know you have to talk, think about your return on investment and in this context we are talking about uh, you know a political aspect to it i mean one has heard a lot of criticism in fact about the fact that uh, under the pli scheme and in fact in uh, for semiconductors there is criticism that uh, you know the government is offering so much subsidy to the private sector and why should they be doing that i mean uh, industries should come up on their own well the fact of the matter is as far as semiconductors is concerned there are few uh, countries in the world which have not enabled the industry private industry to come up they have all given substantial financial support in taiwan also without substantial government support it would not have been possible for private sector to make these kind of huge investments so whether it is taiwan whether it is us whether it is germany in sectors like semiconductors where very massive uh, investments are needed uh, there is no question that the government has to put in this kind of it has to provide these kind of incentives and this kind of support to create the right kind of ecosystem so this is uh, the political angle is of course always there because you know um, everyone wants uh, to criticize there's no harm in healthy criticism but these are on business issues i think people should take a, a hard look at the rationale behind businesses investing yeah uh, shushma let's also talk about the international perspective you know we all have been you know discussing and talking about uh, taiwan being a hub for uh, you know semiconductors mm-hmm. Uh, do you think uh, uh, at this point in time or maybe you know 2 3 years from uh, in the past the entire world and maybe you know america yeah. and other uh, some of a handful of other powerful countries are kind of jittery yeah. and nervous that the entire supply yeah. comes from just one place so now they want to yeah. diversify and maybe look at some stable options Uh, as we all uh, know of this threat of you know chinese aggression on on taiwan which can yes. totally derail the uh, entire supply chain so do you think that is the reason uh, now they are looking for other places and maybe focusing on 
India also and we mm. at this juncture at this point in time should actually you know uh, exploit that situation and take it to our benefit yes uh, so there are two three things in this first of all uh, when you talk about taiwan we can't forget the fact that china is also a major uh, manufacturer of semiconductors and you know so if you uh, consider the fact that the major semiconductor countries producing countries are the us china taiwan and uh, south korea and if there is some conflict i mean not only taiwan but china goes out of the picture so you really have you know a very small number of countries producing semiconductors so it becomes critical and i think the term prader used meta critical for yeah. the world not just india for the world to create another ecosystem for manufacturing semiconductors so if you and as you rightly pointed out you have to look for countries where there is stability now india certainly despite the fact of uh, you know geopolitical turmoil in the rest of the world india has managed to have you know uh, a fairly high growth rate india is one of the few countries which has main, managed to control inflation india is one of the few countries which has not had its uh, for instance food supply disrupted its manufacturing disrupted by all the geopolitical turmoil that is going on so to that extent it is a stable environment secondly it has developed uh, this partnership now with the united states which is uh, going to be a very important uh, partnership in technological terms so uh, certainly i think uh, india is a place that uh, you know uh, not only the us but uh, australia japan other countries are looking to locate you know investments of critical industries which could be uh, affected in case of any geopolitical event over here the second thing that one needs to point out is something that the world bank chief ajay banga pointed out he said this the whole china plus policy that is of companies seeking to invest in countries other than china or along uh, with in addition to china is not going to you're not going to have this window for long it's going to be a 3 to 5 year window it's not going to be a 10 year window and therefore the policy environment in this country certainly needs to be welcoming and supportive now i think what has happened what happens is that at the macro level we have a very good policies but what happens at the micro level is that you are still having a lot of bureaucracy and red tape and that is where uh, the government needs uh, to carry out reforms uh, they've done a lot of reforms i think just today one read about the fact that they are dismantling old laws which were criminalizing Uh, tiny offenses by companies and uh, so they are doing a lot at the micro level but even more needs to be done because unfortunately we had this license raj regime for so many decades and uh, that has set up very rigid systems and gave a lot of power to the bureaucracy yeah and uh, pranay what would you say the recent visit uh, of our prime minister the state visit uh, to the us has given the you know added the impetus to the focus on uh, semiconductors now we are kind of assured of uh, america's support right so see us and india signed first the iset agreement between the two national security advisers last year that paved the path for technology cooperation between both countries and then when the official state visit of the pm happened three important deals were signed one was micron which is a big memory manufacturer it promised to make a memory assembly plant in india so that was the first deal which was agreed by the india semiconductor mission until now whatever things you have been hearing are just memoranda of understanding they are not hard decisions none of them were approved by the india semiconductor mission but this is the first approval that has been given so this will become reality right so that was one big thing it uh, the first company which is doing semiconductor assembly in a large way is micron which is a great tech partner to have uh, if this plant succeeds it will be a signaling effect for other semiconductor uh, semiconductor manufacturers to put their money and weight behind india's manufacturing plants so that is the one thing the second initiative was that applied materials which is a very important player in semiconductor manufacturing equipment it promised 
400 million dollars to set up a collaborative engineering center in India. That is again good news on building on our comparative strength, which is training, which is uh, human power and training them further. The third one was by LAM Research, uh, which I already said, which uh, is going to train around 60,000 Indian engineers in manufacturing, etc. So these are really positive things which came out from the visit and semiconductors were front and center of uh, the announcements and the joint statements, which clearly says that, uh, you know, there is some understanding between uh, the two countries. You have to remember that the, there are comparative advantages at play, right? U.S. cannot do all of the manufacturing on its own. If it has to sort of do trailing edge semiconductor manufacturing, the cost in the U.S. will be humongous. Uh, so that's why for them it is beneficial to target the most advanced chips, whereas the trailing edge nodes could be left to uh, countries like India. And it will be good for India as well because we are just starting in this game of uh, chip production. Uh, so from that angle, there is an arrangement. And uh, like Sushma ji also mentioned about the Quad collaboration, the Quad Semiconductor Supply Chain Initiative is another way in which US and India and Japan and Australia are trying to do things together. The first step that they are trying to do is to map the semiconductor supply chain such that if there are uh, emerging bottlenecks or if there are things that can be predicted on shortages, there can be things done in advance. So that is the first step, but a lot more can be done. There could be a quad sort of consortium to build prototyping fabs. There could be a lot done in terms of centers of excellence. Japan is great in manufacturing and equipment and the materials. Uh, Australia is good in the downstream uh, works of uh, materials, etc. And also in the electric vehicle space, whereas US is the most important player in this industry in terms of design, etc. Right. So there are uh, strengths, complementary strengths of all the four countries and that can be brought to bear to create a more resilient semiconductor supply chain. Yeah, uh, Pranay, uh, even earlier you spoke about uh, this aspect that, you know, as, as far as semiconductors are concerned, the design, the fabrication and assembly and usage, they're all kind of uh, not integrated at this juncture and geographically happens at different locations. Can we, you know, in India, have an integrated center or maybe a cluster somewhere and have all these three or four aspects together, the design, fabrication, assembly and application and usage in at one place or there could be, you know, challenges to that? I don't think that can happen in any one country. If okay. not, it doesn't even happen in the US. See, the way it works is you don't need to be fully self-reliant in semiconductors. No country is even, Taiwan's biggest export is chips, but its biggest import is also chips. So there is no country which does everything on its own for simple cost reasons, right? For example, if you want to just assemble a printed circuit board, the cost will be so high in the US that there players will be uncompetitive and hence it moves to places where costs are low like in China or in India or in Taiwan or Singapore. So that's how the industry operates. Even in India, the way I put it is we should target self-strength and not self-sufficiency. The goal shouldn't be becoming Atmanirbhar fully in semiconductors. We can't do that. And I think the government gets that. That's why the aim here is not to do everything on our own, but to at least start incubating players in each of these segments such that we have capability across the semiconductor supply chain. We will not be able to make every chip that we want, but we will have capabilities if required and we will also have strength from a geopolitical point of view, right? So just imagine if the world's entire semiconductor design is being done in India or is being done by Indian engineers, it is a leverage that we have in this industry. So we will, so the idea is build on our comparative advantages, reduce some vulnerabilities in terms of learning how to do chip manufacturing and also capitalize on the assembly where we actually have a cost advantage and that is a labor intensive sector where we can uh, quickly get started. So that's how I would look at it. It's not about becoming self-sufficient. It's about gaining strength in the, a critical industry. Well, on that note, uh, let's wind up this wonderful discussion. Pranay and uh, Shushma, thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on Semicon India 2023 in the Semiconductor Mission. The participants were Pranoy Kotasthane, Semiconductor Policy Expert, Sushma Ramachandran, Economic Analyst, and S. Rangabhashim Anchor. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of Akashvani.